Welcome in, everybody, to the Flagship Podcast. I am Chip Brown of Horns247.com, joined, as always, by the managing editor of Horns247, Taylor Estes. Taylor, how you doing? I'm doing well, Chip. How, how about you? I mean, we are into fall camp. Things are happening. In fact, the biggest question going on in Austin, Texas right now is... When is the market going to come back? When are these 100-degree days going to end? And who voted Texas number one in the coaches poll? That I mean, it can't be Steve Sarkeesian because he doesn't have a vote from what my understanding is. So who who do you think it is? I mean, could it be Nick Saban? Just messing with it? That's what I'm like. Is this just like some type of mind-like game that Nick Saban's playing? I don't know. Right. Coaches don't usually vote for their own team. So what if Nick is just feeling especially, uh, you know, kind of tricksterish? Yeah, maybe. We won't find out until, what, the last week of the regular season, I think, is when they release – the weekly rank, right? Isn't that when they yeah. know who, who voted? Yeah, we won't what? find yeah. out until the end of the season, but <laughs> by then, uh, no one will remember this. But at, at this particular time, when it's uh, just people counting down until the beginning of the season, a story like that gets uh, a full day of headlines. So, um, Taylor, we are in to the second week of fall camp and the pads we are recording on Tuesday, the full pads go on today. This is really when we're going to start to find out what's going on with this football team, because, um, you know, up to this point, they've been basically running around in shorts and, and then some shoulder pads, right? But now we're going full pads. Now we're going to tackle to the ground. Well, Steve Sarkeesian said they'll work their way into that probably by Saturday's scrimmage. But these first two scrimmages of fall camp, which will happen this Saturday and the following Saturday, really will determine in the coaches' minds who the starting lineup is. And and so here we go. And really, when you put the full pads on, this is when you start to see, A, can the offensive line block can the defensive line get penetration and B or C depending on if you're counting at home the quarterbacks do they have any pocket presence when everything is uh, collapsing down around them how do they handle that how do they step up in the pocket how do they what kind of pocket presence do they have Taylor because To me, this is the biggest question that Hudson Card has to answer uh, in 2022 because that was the knock on him last season. Has he matured enough to where he's more comfortable in the pocket? To me, if he has any chance of being the starting quarterback for Texas, he has to improve tenfold in terms of his pocket presence because we know Steve Sarkeesian wants a pocket passer. He doesn't want a runner. And Quinn Ewers fits the description. He's Sarkeesian's handpicked guy. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, with with Hudson Card, how many times last season did we hear Steve Sarkeesian use terms similar to like happy feet or he gets too antsy in the pocket? And that's, I think you're spot on, Chip, when you say that that is one, probably the single biggest thing that he needs to prove is improvement with his pocket presence. And, and you don't really know how that's going to be for a quarterback until really the full pass come on. But even then, it, you know, they don't get tackled. It's not like the quarterbacks are getting tackled in practice. So that still, in my opinion, can be something that may not show up until game day. I mean, the, that I think is the reality of the situation. So you better hope. If you're Hudson Carb, I would say especially that you are doing everything else like phenomenally to stay in the mix because I think you're right. I mean, you know, we're not trying to anoint Quinn Ewers as the guy right now, but it would be kind of foolish of us to not acknowledge the fact that this is a guy that Steve Sarkeesian handpicked and brought to Texas and he fits the style of quarterback that Steve Sarkeesian typically um, likes to have. And so the Hudson Card has a lot to definitely prove, I think. 
And the other thing too, Chip, if you think of it this way, I was kind of mentioning this to Jeff Howe at practice last week uh, when we had some open media practices. But the thing that you also have to like consider, I think, a little bit is if Steve Sarkeesian goes with Hudson Card and say it doesn't work out, people are going to be like, he doesn't know what he's doing. He made this mistake last year. You know, it's kind of like, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, you know? And so I think that that's something that you also have to consider is whether it's the right move or not. If for some reason Hudson Card trots out with the ones in game one and doesn't show very well or plays against Alabama and has a poor performance similar to how we had against Arkansas, people are going to be like, here we go again. This is exactly what happened in year one. And how did that end? I mean, I think, you know, the natives are a little restless and they will be, you know, for sure. I think if that plays out. So I almost feel like the safer bet for Steve Sarkeesian right now is to just go with Quinn Ewers and, you know, hope it works out and just roll with some of the punches that are probably likely going to come with starting, you know, a redshirt freshman who doesn't have any experience at the college level. I mean, there's just so many things that you have to consider, I think, when you're looking at this quarterback battle. But I think the the room for error that Steve Sarkeesian has is very minimal entering the season. Yeah. and, And think about all the weeks last season where Steve Sarkeesian opted to go with Casey Thompson. He watched Hudson Card in practice. He really didn't go with Hudson Card again unless he felt like Casey Thompson's thumb was an issue. So we saw him at Iowa State. We saw him in at West Virginia. And then inexplicably to me, because it was clear that Casey's thumb was – was not reacting well in cold weather. And then when he was in warm weather, he threw it well, like we saw in the Kansas game, he throws for five touchdowns and leads Texas back into that game. When Hudson card is struggling and getting strip sacked and, um, you know, people are like, well, the offensive line was terrible. Well, the the offensive line was terrible for both guys, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's, that's where, um, you know, you think of Steve Sarkeesian and all the times he watched Hudson Card in practice and opted not to go with him as the starter. Can Hudson Card do enough to to change Steve Sarkeesian's mind? And I I give Hudson Card a lot of credit. He loves Texas. He he wants his degree from Texas. He's dreamed of playing quarterback in Texas, and he feels like he outplayed Quinn Ewers in the spring, and he might have. He, he probably did based on the turnovers that I've heard that, that Quinn Ewers had, but just, and I'm not going to overcook this Taylor, but just in the open windows that we saw Quinn Ewers looked more comfortable. It looked like Hudson card was pressing a little bit, missing some throws. Justin, we, we only saw individual passing drills where the receivers are running against air Mm -hmm. and the quarterback's just trying to put the ball out there and, and hit them. And he was missing, you know, a couple of deep outs to Isaiah Nair and and Brennan Thompson and and Quinn Ewers looked more comfortable. Now Quinn Ewers missed a pass too that we saw, but Card missed like four. So right, and he's see. feeling it a lot more. I felt like you know when you when he was trying to do some of the deep ball, it was it was. And this is a very small overthrew. Window. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's let's not overcook it. This is a very small window, but he definitely overthrew his receivers by a long shot on some of those. And it was, I mean, enough to where, even though it was a small window that that's the takeaway was, man, he couldn't hit a wide open receiver that wasn't being covered, you know, and with no pressure on him either. So yeah, I think, I think that maybe, maybe we just saw him in on, on, you know, off days. I don't know, but I agree with you. I think Quinn Ewers has looked in the limited windows that we have seen. He does look or appear to be a little bit more comfortable than Hudson card. And that's a little surprising chip. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is where you expect your veteran to step up and really assert himself in every possible way. And, and we'll see, we'll see, look, the pads are coming on. This is where we're going to hear. And well, we're going to hear from our sources about who's doing well. The coaches are going to see what's going on in those scrimmages and, and in these practices and, and Taylor, you know, these preseason polls come out and Texas is picked to finish fourth in the in the Big 12. And you're looking for difference makers. You're looking for difference makers. And Texas has those 
at the skill positions on offense, no question. Bijan Robinson, even Roshan Johnson, uh, you know, Xavier Worthy, Jordan Whittington proved to be a money guy on third down. Isaiah Nair had 12 touchdown catches last year. Defensively, this is where my focus is going with the pads going on because that defense was such a mystery. And and if you um, are a loyal listener to the flagship podcast and you've already heard the flagship podcast interview with Gabe Eichard, the, the former OU center, who is a on-air host on uh, Sirius XM Big 12 radio on channel 375, he said, they underperformed that defensive line underperformed and and that's not breaking news, but why, why did it underperform? And we're hearing that, you know, Steve Sarkeesian saying Bo Davis, the, there's a better rapport with uh, on the defensive line with their coach, Bo Davis, that Bo Davis is being allowed to coach the way he wants to coach. We know that Pete Kwiatkowski, the defensive coordinator also coaches the defensive ends uh, at Texas, those two have to be on the same page, Taylor. And that's what I'm looking to see here as the pads go on. What are we getting out of that front, uh, in this defense? How aligned are these players? How aligned are they with their coaches and how aligned are the coaches with each other? Cause you got Gary Patterson out there in the middle of practice and he's taking notes and, you know, talking to position coaches about what he's seeing, maybe loud enough for players to hear. Um, you know, is this defense ready to put it all together and and improve from just an abysmal uh, season last year? And again, not to, wasn't blanket terrible. There were first halves where they were really good, but when it mattered most, the defense didn't hold up. Uh, when the game was on the line, they didn't hold up. So, is that defense ready to take that step? Because there is talent in that front. There's talent on that defensive line. You know, Alfred Collins may have finished as a high four star, but he was a five star at one point. Um, we know Byron Murphy can play. We know Tavondre Sweat looks like an NFL player. Keandre Coburn's been here forever. Taylor, it's got to be better. Yeah, it it absolutely has to be. And and I do, I mean, I I kind of want to give, a part of me kind of wants to give Pete Kwiatkowski and the defensive staff a little bit of a benefit of the doubt, honestly, going into this year from when you talk about the coaches needing to be aligned with one another too and gelling together, that that's something that takes time. So I think that alone, the fact that the staff has a whole year of them actually coaching together when all of them were you know, handpicked by Steve Sarkeesian, not guys that had much familiarity with one another, um, you know, being on, on defense or any type of defensive staff in the past. I feel like I want to give the benefit of the doubt because I feel like that alone is going to help the defense improve. Because when, when you know, a team or it, it, any type of thing, even with a workplace situation, when everyone's on the same page, usually more success will follow. When people are doing their own thing and, you know, uh, just focusing on whatever they individually are, you know, doing and not the overall picture. I do think that that's when a lot of times you get the, you know, breaking down in what you saw in games last year. You know, it was like they didn't know the players almost didn't know what to do when adversity struck. And I think a lot of that probably had to do with the unfamiliarity, both, you know, with learning a new defensive scheme that year, plus not knowing any of these coaches and the coaches not really knowing how to work together very well either because they hadn't done it. So I do think, I feel like that's where I almost feel like I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and expect a much better product because, you know, when you when you do look at the talent, especially at the, at the front of the defense, there's a lot of talent there. As you mentioned, you know, I mean, Tavondre Sweat should be coming on being in his fourth year at Texas. Keandre Coburn's got to be coming on. Byron Murphy, um, Alfred Collins. I mean, these are guys that have very high ceilings and now it's time for them to show it. Because obviously the back end of the defense is still going to be at least a question mark. I don't want to call it a liability yet, but it's definitely going to be a question mark going in to this season. Um, and so the front of the defense has to really hold it all together. I, I mean, maybe maybe I'm just being too optimistic, um, but I feel like it has to be better just for the consistency on that side of the ball. Am I Am I crazy? No. I mean, there's enough talent there. Like if you think, if you took – 
Nick Saban or Kirby Smart and said, what would they do with Texas's talent on defense? Like, you'd feel really good about it. Mm -hmm. Those are both defensive-minded head coaches. I've said this till I'm blue in the face. An offensive-minded head coach is going to be made or broken based on his defense. How well does he hire coaches to coach defense? How aligned and how much because defensive minded head coaches are just naturally tougher. You know, they have to, they have to absorb the punch on defense. So they typically have to be tougher. I mean, they like to think that they administer the punch, but the offense knows where they're going. The defense doesn't. And so, you know, there's just a philosophy, a mindset. That's why I always credited Bob Stoops at OU because you know, he's a defensive minded head coach, but he hired offense really well, mm-hmm. you know, from Mike Leach to Mark Mangino to, you know, uh, Kevin Wilson. He hired really, really good offensive coaches to handle that side of the ball. And then Stoops provided a really tough minded message. And, and, you know, even heck, even to Tom Herman's credit, who we learned this week, Tom Herman's going to be a announcer, a color analyst for CBS uh, on television this year. He's, I think he's got the uh, SMU North Texas game on September 3rd, but his teams were physical and, and he's an offensive minded guy. Well, that's what I want to see from this defense this year. Taylor is where's that edge where's that toughness coming from i that was always sort of my complaint with mac brown when he was at texas he always i always said he should have to donate fifty thousand dollars to charity every time he said the word physical because (laughs) his teams weren't that physical now oh five okay um but you know that's the thing and and so i just want to see it i want to see that this year if i see that you take, you know, a physical defense with what Steve Sarkeesian can do offensively. Okay. Then the the program's going to be moving in the right direction. If we don't see it and I get it, there's help on the way there's talent in the pipeline, but great coaches reveal themselves in the first three years, usually in the first two years, heck Tom Herman went to the sugar bowl and won the sugar bowl in his second year at Texas. They usually start revealing themselves. Mac Brown went to a Big 12 championship game in 1999. He lost it to Nebraska, but you know, he played he was in position mm-hmm. to win a conference championship in in year 2. So, we should see this, Taylor. We should see that arrow going up. And that's what I'm really looking for. I mean, as these pads go on, this is where we find out who really wants it. It's hot. Um we're Recording on Tuesday, they're practicing at 2.45 in the afternoon. It's brutal, but brutal, yeah. this is where we should start to see that, that physical edge, that toughness, that camaraderie, because we already know there's adversity coming in the season early. Right. And and I think you also, this is where you're going to see how well the strength and conditioning offseason program has has worked or where maybe it hasn't. Um, you know, I know that was a lot of questions that people had coming out of last year when when the team kind of looked tired in the second half of games and really that's when they lost a lot of the games. Um, I, you know, I think that Tori Becton, what Steve Sarkeesian kind of talked about was it was a lot more learning in year one under the strength and conditioning program, just like how to accurately, you know, <laughs> lift weights and things like that. Cause there was a lot of technical things that they were doing wrong as a team. So this was more, this year was more focused on, you know, adding the bulk and getting the, the in the best shape possible. And I think that's something Tori Beckton's definitely going to have to prove. And we need to see that I think as a whole from Texas on both sides of the wall, ball, but especially on defense, um, because, Clearly, that was an issue last year, and that can't you can't have those issues as you mentioned. You know, you want to see improvement. You can't have the same issues show up year after year because that, to me, is a sign of the not very well coached team. And Steve Sarkeesian and the staff really don't have much time after that five and seven season last year to to you know time's not on their side. I think is a fair thing to say at a place like Texas that's been really quick to turn over head coaches and coaching staff. So. Yeah, I think you, you right now is when we're going to see how much work this offseason strength and conditioning program 
uh, really has impacted the team, whether it's positive or negative, but you would hope that it's positive um, just with all things considered going into the season, Chip. Yeah, and I think some of what we saw last year in the second half of games was, you know, confusion. Yeah. And, you know, not not being a, a united football team, not willing to to go down on your shield for your for your teammate there was a lot of this isn't going well and i'm sick of this and Mm -hmm. and that that showed and everyone's looking at texas going oh there's texas entitled texas doesn't go their way they take their ball they go home well that's gotta change and these coaches we heard bo davis on that bus after the iowa state game how pissed off he was i'm i'm embarrassed yeah and you know that's the kind of fight in tenacity that you want to see in these guys. And it's a whole thing. You've got to, you know, it's like that poison song. Give me some to believe in. The players are saying to the coaches, give me some to believe in. Put me in the right position to make plays. The coaches are saying to the players, give me some to believe in. Let me see you make a play. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it's all got to go hand in hand. And then it's got to be, happening every week. We say all the time, the sign of a well-coached team is week to week improvement. Even if you get blitzed in week two against Alabama, how did you play? How did you respond? Did you come up with, you know, some plays that were like, wow, okay, this is a Texas team that's moving in the right direction. They're playing with confidence. They're playing together. We can see that. If we don't see it, then we, Everyone's going to grip and hold their breath and wonder, uh uh-oh, what's going to happen against UTSA in week three? (laughs) And and so it's it's fascinating to me. Football is just the most unbelievable team sport because you've got, you know, 11 guys. They all got to be on the same page at at any given time. And you got to have them all willing to, you know, die for each other. And we've heard so much about culture. And Steve Sarkeesian trying to get his culture in because whatever that was last year was a disaster. I mean, I hate to go back to last year, but that's what you're based on. I mean, even Steve Sarkeesian said it. You're you're based on what your record says you are. And, and so everyone always wants to believe Texas has the talent to be number 18 in the coaches poll or, you know, finish fourth in the Big 12. Last year, they were right there with, TCU and Kansas at the bottom of the conference, Taylor, it was, it was awful. And, and so, you know, mentally is this football team, a different football team. Yeah. And they, they're going to have to show it and they're going to have to show it early. Cause this is not an easy schedule that Texas has um, this season. I, I forget what Phil Steele had them ranked their season schedule, but it's one of the tougher ones um, in the country that Texas is going to have to play. And, you know, that's, you, you got to be ready for it. There's no excuses. Your, your year for excuses is up. You know, the, the first year jitters, the first year issues, the first year adversity, all of that, that happened, you know, the, those can't be excuses in year two. So now you've just got to show it and you've got to show it early with the schedule that Texas is um, going to be playing this year. Yeah. And they're just little nagging things, you know, cause I said, I'm not, I said a successful year in 2022 would be eight wins in Arch Manning. Texas already has the commitment from Arch Manning. Now go get the eight wins and show that you've made improvement and, you know, continue to build and let these offensive and defensive linemen get another year into the program and, and let's see where they are. But you look at this and they're little nagging questions. Like the, we've talked about, you know, the safeties all coming from other positions. Uh, Jaron Thompson's the returning guy. He got benched uh, five games into the season last year Uh, at corner. You've got Deshaun Jameson and Ryan Watts. Who else? Uh, Jalen Gilbo's working. You know, we've talked about him having maybe the definitely the best spring of any of the young corners. And now he's working at nickel along with Jade Barron um, because they want to have, a bunch of versatility in part because they don't have a lot of proven depth. Right. If they suffer an injury, guys are going to have to be ready to jump in wherever, wherever needed. 
And then at linebacker, it sounds good. Jalen Ford, everybody's on board. Everyone loves little D tuck from James Madison, David Benda, um, you know, DeMarvin Overshawn. But is that front going to occupy any blockers and allow those linebackers to make plays? To me, it's still such a big question. And I'm not going to give any benefit of the doubt until I see it because last year has like burned like a, like a branded, you know, steer on my brain, just this chaos. And yeah. I've always said when it doesn't look good from the outside, if it looks disorganized to a fan, it's there's, there's a communication breakdown somewhere. Yeah. Whether it's, it's player to player behind closed doors, basically. Right whether it's player to player or coach to player or coach to coach, there is a breakdown happening somewhere when you're just getting gashed by the same play over and over again. And, and so it's what have these coaches learned? That's all playing out right now in fall camp pads are going on. Players are giving it everything they've got. Cause they got some talented dudes who are probably playing their last season. Bijan Robinson, um, you know, we'll uh, all the seniors, obviously, but it's when you have a guy like Bijan Robinson and Xavier worthy, and even Isaiah Nay are 12 touchdown catches in a season. I don't care if you played at Holy cross, you catch 12 touchdowns. You've had a year. This guy did it in the mountain West, did it D one and is, you know, a kid who is a freak athletically who was discovered his going into his junior year in high school as a football player was a basketball player his best football is ahead of him. This is exciting. There's a lot of exciting elements to this team, but then there's a lot of nagging stuff. You know, the defensive front, the, is the secondary going to hold up the kicking game? What's going on with the offensive line? It's, you know, it's, I don't know. Texas fans are just like, they're so tired of wait till next year. They want to see something now. They want to give me something to believe in. We should be playing poison right now. (laughs) <laughs> you're you know? aging yourself chip i think you're that's aging true. yourself but that's a class that reference, i mean, but... <laughs> I mean let's, let's admit all right taylor um we've got another countdown we do we're getting closer to the season so now we're going to start um ranking the schedule easiest games to hardest okay kids <laughs> easiest games to hardest we're going to count these down over the next three weeks here on the flagship podcast. So starting with the easiest game, Taylor, Louisiana Monroe week one. Here's your I chance. A lot of people expected Kansas to be this one, right? But <laughs> not but until Kansas, they prove it, not until they prove it. Right. <laughs> Kansas. I mean, Steve Sarkeesian's own one against Kansas for God's sake. Uh, sorry, I got like something in my eye. Um, Louisiana Monroe. Okay. Terry Bowden, Terry Bowden, the former Auburn head coach, his dad, Bobby Bowden, legend at Florida state. And he took over Louisiana Monroe. They went four and eight last year. They've got, uh, they got seven starters back on defense, or excuse me, seven starters back on offense. And six starters back on defense, but, you know, they only scored 20.9 points per game last year and gave up 33.5 and they're starting over at, at quarterback. Last year they had Rich Rodriguez as the offensive coordinator because his son was the quarterback. Then his, his son graduated, Rich Rodriguez moved on. So this is Louisiana Monroe in the Sun Belt. And I don't see a, a quarterback or anything that, that scares you. This is the easiest game on the Texas schedule. It's week one. Get a chance to get in there, get some confidence, Taylor. Because you know the hardest game is probably in week two. Yeah, no, that's what I was going to. I mean, I feel like this is a really good starter game for Texas, especially with whoever is the, named the starting quarterback. I mean, getting those type of reps in, um, and an actual game setting is going to be crucial for what is coming in week two. So, you know, I, I know that Kansas could probably be the quote unquote easiest game on the schedule, but some people may say, 
I'm not, I'm not, there's no way I'm going to say Kansas is the easiest one just since they lost last year. And plus I do think Kansas actually has decent amount of talent coming back. But so, yeah, I, I, I agree with this. So I, I'm going to preface this, the rankings that are on the screen. If you're watching on the horse 24 seven YouTube channel, I put chips rankings. Mine may not be the exact same, but the ones listed are chips. I do agree with this. So chip, I think this is a good starter game before Texas faces Alabama in week two at home. Okay. So we agree on that. We agree. Yep. Louisiana. Right. Second easiest game on the schedule. And I had to like, think about this for a second. <laughs> it's Kansas. Yeah. Even though you're playing in Lawrence in November. Texas has had some weird trips to Lawrence. Like, I don't know. And OU had a weird trip to Lawrence last year. Mm -hmm. That was Caleb Williams sure. ripping the ball out of Kennedy Brooks's hands to on fourth down to save them. Yeah. Um, but look, Lance Leipold found something in, uh, in their quarterback, Devin Neal. He was running all over the place against Texas. They've got some good skill talent, whatever. Texas should beat Kansas. Yes, they should. In Lawrence. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't even want to like speak this into existence or anything, but could you imagine starting off 0 2 against Kansas? <laughs> I mean, oh boy. That would be awful. Yeah. That'd be and, awful. Yeah. And, and I do kind of like what Lance Leopold's doing at Kansas right now. I feel like they were more competitive in games last year. Sure. They only won two and that Texas was one of them, unfortunately for Texas fans, but I do feel that they were a little bit more competitive than you've seen of Kansas teams as of, you know, last several decades now, but yeah, this should be the second easiest game on Texas schedule. If it's not, then I don't even want to know what conversations we're having on November 19th after that game chip. Yeah. <laughs> um, we won't, we're not going to bog you down with Kansas stats. No. Um, they were two and 10 last year and one of the wins was against Texas. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now maybe this is where we start to diverge Taylor, but I think the third easiest game on Texas's schedule is TCU. It's at home. It's November 12th. Um, TCU's defense. Now, as much as everyone's all excited about Gary Patterson, TCU's defense was not good enough last year. And um, they, they gave up more than 200 yards rushing, just like Texas. And, and TCU gave up 34.9 points per game. That's just not Gary Patterson. Like only averaged 28.7 points per game. Uh, that's not going to cut it when you're giving up more than you're scoring and O'Shawn Mathis is gone. He went to Nebraska and I just don't know that Sonny Dykes has the, the defense that, um, you know, I don't know what Sonny's going to be able to, to pull off on defense, but they've got quarterbacks. Max Duggan has got two wins against Texas. Uh, they got Chandler Morris. They've got really good skill talent, Quentin Johnston. Uh, they got a really uh, good running back room, but I think Steve Sarkeesian's offense should be able to move the football against TCU. I don't know. Um, I don't have the feeling that that TCU is is ready uh, in year one under Sonny Dykes, Taylor. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, I mean, I feel like with this game being later in the season, that may bode better for TCU because you know you'll you would think they would kind of work out the first year you know staff type of kinks that may show up earlier in the season but I I think it's always difficult to it's always difficult to take over a football program and it's especially difficult to take over after a coach that I mean they have, isn't there a statue of Gary Patterson on like campus oh yeah so I mean that that's the that's the level of coach you're taking over I feel like there's always going to be that transition. So I, while TCU is kind of one of those teams to me, Chip, that they may be way better when it's all said and done, just because they do have a lot of experience returning. I think Phil Steele says that they have 10 um, starters on offense and then eight on defense or with, you know, starting experience returning to the team this year. Um, 
they this could be a, a trap type of game, but at this point, I do think that I would say that this is one of the easier games on the schedule. I, I would probably agree with you at, at number 10 with the, I, I would probably say either nine or 10, but yeah, I would say, you know, the first quarter, what quarter of the schedule, I guess. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Is it in quarters, no, thirds, the thirds. first third. Yeah. <laughs> it would, this game would fall in the, the lower tier of the first third. Okay. All right. Um, Next one's where I, we're going to disagree though. Okay. This is good then. <laughs> okay. So Taylor, I say the next easiest game on the schedule is at Texas tech on September 24th. Now I love Joey McGuire. I love his energy. I just don't know if they have enough again, defensively uh, to, to slow down Steve Sarkeesian's offense. And I, I like Tyler Shuck, although Texas destroyed him last year. He actually got injured in the Texas game. Um, and I like the running back room, Sir Roderick um, Thompson. I like, um, you know, uh, Taj Brooks at running back. Eric ezekanma has gone. But Tech has good skill. I just don't see it coming together. Uh, for Joey McGuire in part because this game is early in the season. That's another reason that I have it here. You're playing on September 24th. Uh, Texas Tech probably won't have everything figured out at that point. They're opening with Murray State. They'll play Houston. Actually, they will play a tough game at NC State right before they play Texas. And um, depending on how they perform in that game, it might give Texas a false sense of security going out to Lubbock. But I, I think this is uh, one of the four easiest games for Texas this season. Your thoughts? I I would I would probably say Iowa State is one. Now, the only thing with the Iowa State game for Texas this year is it does come. It's going to fall right after the OU game, and Texas will have been on – think like a seven or eight game stretch or I think seven game that would be their seven straight game of the season so that kind of gives me pause a little bit but I do think that I think Texas Tech has a little bit more upside this season than Iowa State um even though there is you know a new head coach in Lubbock I do like I've always liked Joey McGuire as a coach I feel like he's he's a one of the better fits probably for that job. Honestly, I think that they did a fantastic job of hiring him for that role. He understands, I think the community in Lubbock. I just, I feel like, I feel like he's going to be a success in Lubbock. It may not be in year one, but I do think I feel better about where Texas tech is right now than where Iowa state is with Iowa state. I think they only have three starters returning on defense. Um, you know, there's a lot of talent that they are, replacing um from last year that game is at home for texas so i would personally say uh the fourth easiest game on the schedule for texas is iowa state not not texas tech okay all right that is uh that's a good place to leave it because we're we're going to be counting down the next four um hardest you know easiest to hardest games for texas we just gave you the easiest taylor thinks iowa state is going to be in the four easiest games. I've got um, at Texas Tech in there. Notice how neither one of us have UTSA in no. <laughs> those uh, among the four easiest games for Texas. All right, a couple of nuggets before we get to love it or leave it. Chris Beard has now replaced both of his um, assistant coaches. His asso associate head coach is Rodney Terry. But both of his assistant coaches have now been replaced. Yurik Malaga is uh, now at Kansas State. And this past week, Jarence Howard resigned. And uh, he's going to be, he came from Kansas. He's going to be replaced by um, Bob Donawald Jr., who is already on Chris Beard's staff as a special assistant. And um, Taylor, you're, you're the baseball seam head. I'm hearing Troy Tulowitzki is going to stay on and continue to help the Texas program in a volunteer role. And that's significant. He turned down USC. 
He's a paid role there. A, yeah, the head job. The head job, yeah. Um, and actually, he turned down a big payday from Texas, and 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 yet he's still coming to the ballpark. He and David Pierce, from what I'm told, had a great conversation. Uh, Troy Tulowitzki wants to become a head coach, and he wants to, you know, experience everything he needs to experience, and he he can coach the X's and O's the part of the game that he doesn't feel totally on top of is recruiting. And I think David Pierce said, listen, I'll, I'll help you learn that. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how this plays out. Obviously David Pierce hired Woody Williams as the pitching coach um, and former Baylor head coach, Steve Rodriguez to, to work with the hitters. Um, but we know that Troy Tulowitzki has worked with the hitters in the infield infielders in the past. So, um, that's, that's some good news every day that Troy Tulowitzki is coming to the ballpark is a good day for, for Texas baseball. All right. Uh, Taylor, you ready for some love it or leave it? I am before we get to love it or leave it. We're going to take a really quick break, but stick around. We will have more football talk coming up. So stay tuned. We will be right back. And if you're watching us on the horns, 24 seven YouTube channel, we're going to roll on here to love it or leave it. Chip, you ready? Let's go. All right. My first one for you is love it or leave it. The coach who voted Texas number one in the preseason coaches poll was really trying to vote for Texas A&M. Okay. That's probably true, but I'm going to leave this because I like my conspiracy theory way better <laughs> that Nick Saban was poking some fun at his his former offensive coordinator, Steve Sarkeesian. I mean, after all, Texas got the Arch Manning commitment. Alabama didn't. And, you know, Sarkeesian raided Saban's staff of Jeff Banks and A.J. Milwee and Kyle Flood. I think he wanted Pete Golding, too, as the defensive coordinator. Didn't get him. Nick said no. So, Taylor, I'm going to stick with my conspiracy theory. That it was Nick Saban poking a little at Steve Sarkeesian. Um, so I'm going to leave it. How about you? I'm going to leave it. And I'm I'm solely doing it because I really hope that is the case. Like, I really hope it was Nick Saban messing with Steve Car Sarkeesian. Because that would just be, I mean, it, it just I, I'm like so excited to for that final week of the coaches poll to come out so we can see who actually did this. Because... If it's Nick Saban, then I just absolutely going to love it. And plus, it's going to be funny to see the two of them compete when Texas goes to the SEC if it is Nick Saban. So I'm going to leave it. I'm I'm going to hope the conspiracy theory is right and that it was actually Nick Saban intentionally voting for Texas. <laughs> All right. We, uh, we're on the same page there. All right. Love yeah. it or leave it. Number two. All right. My second one for you is love it or leave it. Last season, Texas had more sacks given up with 26 than sacks of opposing quarterbacks of 20. This season, those numbers will be flipped. They better be. <laughs> they better be, Taylor, or we might be looking at another uh, tough season here. Uh, I'm going to love this just because I'm going to I said I wasn't going to give benefit of the doubt, but I'm going to give benefit of the doubt uh, to these coaches in bringing in players who can get it done or the ability to coach up the players who had to, you know, languish through that five and seven season. Those players should never, ever, ever uh, want to experience that again and should be moving heaven and earth, even in 105 degree heat to make sure that never happens again. So I am going to love this, uh, even though, as we discussed in today's flagship podcast, there's a lot of benefit of the doubt that is going to be required here. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna love it though. How about you? Oh man, I I'm gonna leave it. I think I think that. The benefit of the doubt for me is more that the overall defense will be improved. Um, that that's, I mean, it's not that hard to probably do that either because of how bad the defense was last season. But when it comes to sacks, just because that, I mean, you know, we talked, I, it's hard for me to go back to last season, last spring game. We'll talk about, you know, in 2021 um, when they were just getting after 
the Texas quarterbacks. And then it's like, oh, that was just because the offensive line is so bad. Like it wasn't the defense actually performing at an elite level. So I think that's kind of scarred me a little bit when it comes to talking about sacks specifically. While I do think the defense will be improved, I have to see them actually, you know, get a quarterback on the ground before I'm going to start giving, you know, any type of high expectation for the number of sacks that this Texas defense can do. And I hope I'm wrong because I, I'm more of a defensive person. I, I think you can probably tell that I, um, you know, I, I like talking defense probably more than offense, which is probably weird for some people, but I've just got to, I've got to see it. Cause that, that really shook me hard last year. I mean, when, when we're talking about, you know, Ben Davis being the sack leader for Texas and he had two and a half sacks and he didn't even play in every game and didn't start. It's like, okay, like <laughs> it's going to be hard for me to give much benefit of the doubt that that's going to vastly improve. So I'm going to have to leave that. Show me, yeah. don't tell me. That's yeah. what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. It's understandable. All right. Love it or leave it. Number three. Final one, love it or leave it. If Texas can maintain its average of 35 points per game on, on offense and just hold opponents to 25 points per game on defense, the Longhorns will win at least nine games this season. Yeah, I'm going to love this. I mean, this is a this is a wide open Big 12. Um, you average 35 points in the Big 12 and hold opponents to, to 25. Um you're, you're going to win those close ones that you lost last year. You're going to win the Oklahoma game. You're going to win the Oklahoma State game, the Baylor game, the Kansas game. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to love this. And, and that's a reasonable expectation for a defense that returns seven starters, has a bunch of experience up front, second year in the system you go from 31.1 points per game to 25. I think that's a reasonable uh, expectation for improvement for the Texas defense. So I'm going to love this Taylor. How about you? Yeah. I mean, I I'm going to love it that if this does happen, then yeah, they will win at least nine games. I'm not sure that I would predict it to happen, but if it does play out, then yeah, I would love it and say that Texas would win at least nine games if they were able to accomplish this. But at the end of the day, again, it's show me, don't tell me. So I, I personally think that eight wins, if you, if Texas gets to eight wins this season, you take that as a win, you, you show enough improvement and then, you know, you hope to improve on it next year. Um, I don't, I don't expect Texas to win nine games, but if they are able to accomplish this, you know, having averaging 35 points on offense, holding opponents, 25 points. And yeah, I think that I would be definitely underestimating the amount of wins that Texas had with me saying that I think that they're going to win eight games. So. All right, kids, <laughs> the pads are on Texas football fans. A lot of excitement, a lot of anticipation, a lot of off season momentum. Um, that's going to now find its way into the college football season. And we will continue to count down the uh, easiest to hardest games on Texas's schedule next week. Make sure you check out the flagship podcast interview with Gabe Eichard, the former OU center, who's uh, you can hear him on Sirius XM radio and he's the uh, OU sideline reporter has some interesting thoughts on Texas. He interviewed Steve Sarkeesian at big 12 media days on Sirius XM radio has some interesting thoughts and his thoughts about the Sooners who've had quite a week themselves this week. So uh, for Taylor Estes, I am Chip Brown. Until next time, we'll see you over at horns247.com. Stay safe and keep the faith.